Um, first off, I'd like to welcome everybody here today. I appreciate you coming out and appreciate even more Steve hosting this for us. Um, you know, I have a fair amount of information I'd like to share with you today, some of which may open your eyes, some of which you may already know or may be familiar with. And um, I ask that you hold the questions till the end, though, and I'll stay around forever as long as it takes to answer any questions anybody may have after we're finished with the talk this morning. Uh, I'm Chris Nagy. I'm an orthopedic surgeon here in town. I've been in Salisbury for about 15 years now and uh, kind of always had a, a little bit of a health and wellness bend and uh, I've done a lot of research and work actually over the past couple of years in, in putting together actually a, a wellness center that I started back in this past May. Um, you know, I take care of both men and women in this regard and uh, really a lot of it has to do with hormone optimization. You know, the more I read, the more I learned, and the more I looked at what we currently do in our healthcare system, I thought we can do better. I mean, there's, some people may call this alternative medicine. I'm not sure if I would necessarily call it that because, you know, what we're doing is replacing what we've lost as part of the aging process. You know, alternative medicine may be more what we're doing currently is what we're putting a synthetic chemical in your body to try and affect the result to make you feel better, but it's not something that the body even recognizes as, as normal. So I gave a green smoothie talk here a couple weeks ago, and after the talk, um, I was asked, is there any chance you can maybe talk about women's hormones? And so I thought to myself, well, you know, women's hormones, that's pretty straightforward, easily understood, agreed upon by all physicians, and really not very controversial, so sure. That'd be easy to talk about. That shouldn't be a problem at all, right? Because it's not like every other week you hear a new article about how you're going to die if you use hormone replacement or you're going to have cancer. So uh, I've put together this talk, and I hope I can maybe teach you a couple things or answer some questions that you may have or that you may have felt as time's gone on but really have not had all your questions fully answered. And again, I'll, I'll stay around till the end to answer any questions. And please, if you do have a question or a thought, feel free to ask because the same question you have somebody else has pr probably has too. So, um, you know, starting off, you know, if you look at yourself compared to 10 to 20 years ago, how many of these symptoms are something that you're, you experience or that you felt? Decreased stamina, increased weight, easy fatigue, wrinkles, increased uh, being sick more frequently. You know, if you look at this list, all of them in some way or other are consistent with the aging process. And that's something we all go through. And when you look at aging, uh, what are some things that maybe we can do to battle that or stop the aging process? Certainly, nutrition's right, right at the top. Um, you know, the, the diets that we eat these days are the standard American diet with the acronym the SAD diet, unfortunately, is killing us as a country and as individuals. Um, nutrition's paramount, and we're not, your, your, your best interests are not being looked out for by the, um, companies that make all the food that we eat. You know, the more of a whole food-based diet that you can partake of, the better. Exercise is very important. You know, we've become so electronically connected that we could probably go the whole day without even getting up out of the chair except to go to the bathroom. And we need to move. Our bodies are made to move. Uh, but ultimately, a healthy lifestyle. And you have to choose and consciously work towards a healthy lifestyle. A lot of times, and the people I'm working with or that I'll have on hormone replacement therapy, I'll often ask them, you know, are you willing to lead a hormone healthy lifestyle? And, and what does that mean? Well, that means not excess, you know, try not to smoke, not excessive use of alcohol, proper diet, because this all works together. A hormone optimization is not just here, take these and you'll be healthy the rest of your life. There's some other changes that need to be made uh, most often, or not even necessarily made, but sometimes tweaked. I mean, we all try to live a healthy lifestyle, but uh, there's, there's certain risk factors or things that we do that can dampen or reverse the positive effects of hormone optimization. Stress management is huge. Uh, you know, we used to live in a lifestyle where we weren't faced with stress all the time, but now everything's 24-7, run, run, run. The more stress you have, the more it elevates a hormone called cortisol. The more cortisol you have, the more belly fat you get. The worse you feel, the sicker you become. So stress management is, is, is more than just a catchphrase, handle your stress. I mean, and exercise actually can contribute to decreasing your stress. Each of these individual topics really could be a, a whole hour-long lecture. Uh, but ultimately, it comes down to balance, mind, body, spirit, and uh, the bottom one, hormone optimization, which is what we're here to talk about today. 
And I, you know, I choose the term hormone optimization versus hormone replacement. And it depends on your perspective or your philosophy. You know, if you're menopausal, and this even applies to perimenopausal women, and you're having hot flashes and you can't sleep and you just want to be able to sleep and get rid of your hot flashes, you can do that. But if you're looking at um, optimization, I'm talking about bringing your levels back to a physiologic level that is consistent with health and wellness over the long term and prevention of many of the degenerative diseases. So before we go too much further, the question has to be answered, what are hormones? Uh, and you know, what's all the controversy about that you read about almost on a weekly or biweekly basis? and what things may you want to consider before choosing hormone replacement. Um, now, there's two systems of communication in the body. There's the, the nervous system, or the, or the central nervous system, which is a hardwired system of communication. The brain, the spinal cord, the peripheral nerves. Uh, if you want to use an analogy, you can liken it to the internet. You have the cabled internet, or I guess in Salisbury's case, fiber optic, where everything's connected. And then there's the endocrine system which consists of hormones. And, uh, so this would be the wireless internet system. And what the um, hormones do, a hormone is a substance that's made at one place in your body that has an effect on another place in your body. In a way, hormones are biochemical messengers. And you can, if, you're, if we're using the internet allergy, analogy, they, they would be email. So a hormone send a me sends a message to another part of your body and tells your body what to do. If your hormone levels aren't right, you're not right, essentially. Um, they turn cell functions on and off, and they regulate gene expression. Um, and you know, I pulled this graphic here because I, I didn't want you to think you'd be coming to a hormone lecture and not learning a little bit about organic chemistry. So here's a little organic chemistry for you. <laughs> this is human progesterone. This is the progesterone that's in your system right now. Um, you know, organic chemistry is essentially the study of how carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms all fit together to make the substances in our lives. So if you, you know, this is what your body typically makes. Your corpus luteum makes um, progesterone in the second half of your cycle. If a compounding pharmacist or somebody puts together carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms in this format, it's progesterone, bioidentical progesterone. This is the chemical formula for Provera or medroxy progesterone, which is the synthetic progesterone. And you can see it looks pretty darn similar to the progesterone molecule above. This is typically what's been used for hormone replacement, and this is actually what causes an increased risk of breast cancer, heart disease, blood clots, dementia, and Alzheimer's. And you know, the funny thing about it, and well, it's not funny really, you know, this, this particular molecule increases the risk of breast cancer by 26%, heart attacks by 29, uh, dementia by 41, it doubles the risk of blood clots. And the question I have to ask, which I can't believe, is if this was a supplement that you could, that was on the shelves at a health food store, what would the FDA do to that supplement? They tell me to get it off the shelf. They would rip it off the shelf in a minute. Oh my gosh, look at all the bad things this, this supplement does. It kills people. But this is still on the market and it is still used every day. Prempro. This is the pro part of Prempro. So to me, that speaks a little bit about the authorities, the FDA, looking out for us. You know, we, we like to think that uh, governmental ag agencies have our best interests at heart, but, I mean, not always. I mean, this is still on the market and used not infrequently. Uh, so, so you see that this is quite similar, actually. There's a couple little differences. It's missing a hydrogen here. There's a methyl group here. There's a carboxyl group here. And, you know, the manufacturers will say, well, you know what? There's not that big of a difference between this and this. But just as an example, um, these two groups, this is testosterone, this is estradiol, which is an estrogen. The only difference between this molecule and that molecule is one hydrogen atom. So essentially, everybody here is one hydrogen atom away from being a man. I mean, it, it's just a little, <laughs> except for, well, you know. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, the, the point is, it doesn't take a huge change to affect a big difference. This is estradiol, one of the estrogens, testosterone. Um, so when you look at um, progesterone and Provera, this is the, the steroid metabolic pathway, and this is the last organic slide I'm going to show you. But for progesterone to be metabolized, you need a 17-hydroxylase 
in a 21 hydroxylase to send, ester to send progesterone down the line so that your body breaks it down. We have evolved to have this metabolic process over thousands and thousands and millions of years. So if you give somebody bioidentical progesterone, their body says, hey, I know you. I've worked with you my entire life. I know how to get rid of you. So it, it sends it down the path, breaks it down, and you get rid of it. Now, if you throw this in there, this is a stranger. This first came on the market in 1995. So the human body is saying, what the hell is that? Well, it kind of looks like progesterone. Maybe, well, here, I'll do my best with it. So what happens to, to th this when it enters this pathway? We don't know it, what happens, really. We can't dictate what's, how it gets broken down, but we do know the, the side effects that that causes. So that's your difference between bioidentical hormones and synthetic hormones. Now, some of the thought leaders in health, um, obstetrics and gynecology, family practice, internal medicine, tell us there's no difference between these two. But if you were to poll 100 people off of the street and say, could you look at these two things and tell me, is there a difference there? Every single one of them would get it right. So, you know, it takes the medical profession to kind of make things a little more confusing. And, um, and, and what I often tell people, either you believe it or you don't. You know, if, if, if you were to give me the option, when I lose my hormones, we can give you the hormone that you've always had your entire life. And it's not collected from urine of young women like it used to be in the Chinese dynasties because they use that for health and wellness. It's fabricated, it is synthesized, it's made in labs via wild yam or uh, soy. Now it's not soy as in soy is bad for you, but the final product is this. So they don't, you could extract it from urine, but it's, it's fabricated in a lab to be identical to the human, human progesterone. So what do hormones do? They do everything in our body. They make us who I, they, we are. They regulate growth, apoptosis, which is cell death. They support your immune system. Uh, they're anti-inflammatory, and there are a number of different types of hormones. Uh, we're talking primarily about the sex hormones today. They, they regulate your moods. Uh, a lot of times when people are perimenopausal, 40, 45, a woman's going along in her life and suddenly has a panic attack or anxiety. So how do we treat that in medicine? Oh, well, you need some Lexapro. Um, the first hormone a woman loses in the perimenopausal period is progesterone. Uh, and as the cycles become more regular, progesterone goes up and down. And you progesterone is a calming neurotransmitter. Some call it nature's Valium. So a lot of times if it, when you get that perimenopausal period, 40, 45, you start having some anxiety, panic attacks. A lot of times that's an indication that you're deficient in progesterone. You're not suffering from a Prozac deficiency or Lexapro deficiency. You're suffering from a progesterone deficiency. Um, the neuroendocrine theory of aging, big word, but essentially says... We age because our hormones decline. Our hormones do not decline because we age. Uh, the normal declination of hormones occurs in the process of aging, but that's the, that's the question. Do we age because our hormones decline or do our hormones decline because we age? And then the second question is, are we fooling mother na nature when we replenish hormones? You know, philosophically or ethically, is this the right thing to do? Who are we to mess with mother nature? Well, you know, mother nature's me messing with us, really. And so when you look at it as part of the aging process, you know, aging is not a battle, it's a massacre. It's filled with bad eyes, bad hearing, bad teeth, bad blood vessels, bad joints, bad bones, bad hearts, bad sex, and cancer. All of those things. And all of which we do something to try to prevent and medically um, try to optimize to prevent those type of things from occurring to all of us. Now, you can take the tack that, well, hormone decline is a normal part of aging, so we shouldn't do anything about it. It's common. Well, if we took that line of thinking, then no one in here would have a filling in their mouth or wear glasses, because that's common too. And if you're looking at blood pressure, blood pressure is common. So if we follow that line, well, get rid of all your blood pressure medicines, which is ludicrous and crazy. So just because something is common doesn't mean that we shouldn't necessarily treat it. And it depends on your perspective. Do you want to support yourself over the long term, or do you want to continue to accept the ongoing onslaught of osteoporosis, Alzheimer's disease, heart disease? Uh, I can't tell you that uh, replacing bioidentical hormones is going to make you live longer, but should make you live lo uh, better longer. Uh, you want to live like a seagull, essentially. Seagulls do not die from the ravages of degenerative disease. They live their whole life until 
they die. <laughs> Flying along and I'm dead. So, and that's how you want to live. You know, you don't want to follow the path where you're kind of coming down, coming down, coming down, and then you die. I'm sorry, son, you're just getting older. I'm sorry, ma'am, this is part of aging and you'll have to accept it. It's not really true. You know, as physicians, we spent so much of our time trying to keep you from dying that we've never really helped you with living. And, um, and we can do that. You know, and it takes a lot of education on the patient's part and a lot of the accountability to understand what we're trying to accomplish here. Uh, optimal hormone levels occur during our 20s and 30s and typically uh, decline for a period after that over the next 15 to 20 years. Uh, during that time span, that's where we're typically considered our healthiest. Uh, as, we, as our hormones decline, we do start the aging process more rapidly. And uh, biological age is intimately tied to the decrease in your hormones. There's tons of studies showing the, um, what happens to, to our health and wellness as our hormone levels continue to decline. Uh, from nature's perspective, we are here to repopulate the earth, carry on the uh, DNA lineage, and then we should die. Uh, we essentially become a burden on the system. A hundred years ago, the average life expectancy was 47. Two hundred years ago, it was about 37. Currently, our life expectancy is 78, and that's based on the day you're born. If you live past the age of five, the life expectancy goes up to 84. If you live up to the age 40, 50, you're up to 87. So what that means essentially, and this is, that's not all because of health findings or research, that is primarily because of cleanliness and a lot of things that we've done to avoid bacteria and some of the chronic problems that used to kill people at a younger age. So we're experiencing an aging revolution that is probably going to break the bank health-wise and uh, cost-wise over the long term because as currently as a country, as we get older and older, we're also getting sicker and sicker. And uh, I mean, I think we're a little bit on the wrong path, and this is something that can be done to help right that path. Uh, but it takes an individual to accept doing this. Um, so we're, we're facing living half our lives without our, our beneficial hormones. The other thing that needs to be considered is, is normal versus optimal. Uh, and that, too, is a part of philosophy. You know, you can have some lab work done. It's normal. Oh, it's normal. Everything is good. We'll see you in a year. But, you know, what does normal mean? When you have your labs drawn, there's not a, a generic overall all-encompassing lab range. Your lab results, the reference range is based on your age. The reference range for a 30-year-old is different than a reference range for a 70-year-old. So if you're 70 years old and you're normal and the normal range is 6 to 22 and you're 8, you're normal, but, you know, you're nowhere close to what the reference range would be for a younger person. So when I distinguish between normal and optimal, Optimally, you want to be in the upper three-quarters of the reference range. You know, we'll take vitamin D, for example. The range is 32 to 100. If you're 34, you're normal. If you're 60 to 80, you're optimal. If you have cancer, you probably should be around 80 to 100. So there is a distinction between normal and optimal. And many, many, many studies show the positive health and wellness benefits from having optimal hormone levels. Um, now, this part gets a little bit sticky and a little bit difficult. This is when we're going to look over some of the studies that have come out that have kind of put the kibosh on hormone replacement. Prior to 2002, there were many, many, many studies demonstrating the benefits of hormone replacement, prevention of heart disease, osteoporosis, cancer, Alzheimer's disease. And then in 2002, the world was kind of turned upside down. And that's when the Women's Health Initiative study was uh, published. And as a result of that, 50% of women went off of their hormones, and appropriately so and understandably. So that's kind of what finally closed the door on don't take hormones, they're bad for you, they'll cause cancer. Uh, now the question is, why it, you know, what's the deal? We had all these studies showing the benefits, now we have a study showing the detriment. And um, how could there be, what's the discrepancy there? Or is it possible that all the studies were correct? Uh, and really the answer lies in what each of the studies tell us. And, I'll break down those studies a little bit. The Women's Health Initiative was uh, assessing, assessing primarily the risks and benefits of hormone replacement using, there was two arms. There was the um, estrogen and progestin arm, both synthetic hormones. The pr Premarin that was used, Premarin comes from pregnant mare urine, uh, thus Premarin. And Provera is also a sy synthetic hormone. Um, both of these are not found in the human body, but uh, this is what was used in the Women's Health Initiative study. And then there was the estrogen-only arm, which was just estrogen utilized. There were 16,000 people in the uh, hormone replacement group, Premarin and Prevera, and then there was uh, 10,000 in the estrogen-only arm. Now, the key part of this study 
was that it, the average starting age was 63. You know, typically for optimal results, you want to start hormone replacement around the age of menopause, which in America currently is 51. 66% of the people in this study were over the age of 60. And many had pre-existing risk factors, heart disease, 10% with coronary artery disease, 50% with other risk factors. So, um, so some of the things that, that we learned in the Women's Health Initiative uh, study itself did not really apply to people who were just going through menopause. Uh, there was a 29% increase in the risk of heart attacks in the hormone replacement study, 41% uh, in risk of stroke, invasive breast cancer, 26%, uh, doubling of DVT or blood clots in the legs. Uh, what they, the positive benefits of hormone replacement did demonstrate that uh, there was a decrease in the risk of osteoporosis and fractures, as well as a 37% reduction in colon cancer. So though there are many negative things seen in the hormone replacement or the women's health initiatives, there were some positives. And basically, after that, was, that study was published, they said the risks outweigh the benefits long term. Uh, the hormone replacement is not for primary prevention. And uh, it really should only be treat, used for the treatment of menopausal symptoms at the lowest dose for the shortest period of time possible. Now, there's no study actually looking at the lowest dose for the shortest period of time uh, possible. That's just a, a wager that, well, you know, if they take it for the, the smallest amount for the shortest time possible, they might get away with something. That's basically what that's saying. Uh, there's nothing to really back that up. And you can understand that. You know, the longer you take it, the more at risk you are. Uh, and again, this study, the Women's Health Initiative, ran for five years. So now in the estrogen-only trial, where women were only given estrogen, no progesterone, or excuse me, no progestin, and there's a distinction. When I say progesterone, I mean bioidentical progesterone. There's actually a decreased incidence of breast cancer with just, with just the use of the estrogen, uh, decreased incidence of, cor incidence of coronary artery disease, but there was an increased incidence of stroke and DVT. So, and really, this has to do with both the progestin, but also the route of which the estrogen was administered. Uh, there was no increase in risk of mortality in the estrogen-only arm. And really, based on this um, hormone replacement, estrogen alone was felt to be safe. Now, breaking it down to some of the, some of the specific diseases, heart disease is the number one killer of women in America today. Um, about 267 to 300,000 women die each year of, of heart disease. Typically, that heart disease occurs after the period of menopause. Uh, mortality after a heart attack is much higher in women than it is in men. Um, the, in the hormone replacement trial with Premarin and Provera, there was an increase in the risk of uh, heart attacks. And the increase really occurred more during the first years. But as time went on, uh, there was found to be more protection. There was another study, the a heart estrogen and progesterone replacement study. And this study was done in women with pre-existing coronary artery disease. So they were identified as having coronary artery disease. And it was shown that the hormone replacement did not prevent the coronary artery disease or progression of the disease. What the Women's Health Initiative on secondary analysis did show that the younger you were when you started hormone replacement therapy, the better in shape you were going to be. Um, and bottom line is hormone replacement does not treat heart disease. It prevents it if it started at the proper time, at the time of menopause. But you cannot put a 68-year-old woman on hormone replacement and say, this will prevent your heart disease. Because chances are, by the time you're 68, you've developed some small amount of coronary artery disease. Now, done properly, it's still protective. But uh, again, you have, it has to be given in the proper dosage and in the proper way. Another study is the uh, Nurses Health Study. And that's a study that's been long running that includes 120,000 uh, nurses. And it, too, showed that if it started at menopause, uh, then your risk is much lower and actually preventative of coronary artery disease. Uh, so to reduce the risk, try not to start women over the age of 59, at least with oral estrogen and progestin specifically, uh, starting at menopause before the plaque develops, and uh, avoid the progestin, the synthetic progesterone. Synthetic progesterone, or progestin, is very good for preventing uterine bleeding. And actually, they had to invent that because for the 33 years that Premarin was used prior to progesterone, at least 15,000 cases of uterine cancer were, were reported. And the sad thing about that is, you know, they had to have a double-blind, placebo-controlled tr uh, trial to demonstrate that. You know, you can figure that out just looking in a physiology book. Estrogen and progesterone live in a, in a yin and yang, and they need to be taken together. Estrogen tells your cells in your body to grow, grow, grow. 
uh, just grow, grow, grow. Estrogen is carcinogenic in and of itself. Progestin is the hormone that tells your cells to differentiate and develop and essentially calms down estrogen. So typically what's done in women who don't have a uterus, well, you don't have a uterus, you don't need progesterone. All right, well, then what about all the progesterone receptors on your brain and your heart and your breasts where progesterone is protective or your bones? Progesterone uh, increases bone density. So um, the progestin was good at preventing uterine bleeding and uterine overactivity because of the estrogen stimulation, but it was negative everywhere else across the board. Um, there's been some other studies demonstrating the positive effects of starting hormone replacement for heart disease at the time of menopause. Uh, memory. There's a subsection of the Women's Health Initiative where they took the women aged 65 to 79. The average age was actually 71. And basically they wanted to see, does hormone replacement prevent Alzheimer's disease or treat Alzheimer's disease? Because the previous studies showed that it did. And um, what they basically came up with in this particular study was that it did not and actually increased the risk of uh, Alzheimer's disease. And it's thought to be due to um, little blood clots, oh, mini strokes, uh, it, it, the clotting factors that were caused by the progestin, as well as the oral estrogen. Uh, late administration does nothing to protect Alzheimer's disease, uh, whereas early, early administration does. If you start estrogen at the time of menopause and carry it over for 10 years, admin, uh, 10 years, you reduce your risk of Alzheimer's disease by 83%. Uh, how come you're not hearing that in the media? You know, Alzheimer's is a huge problem. And some of these things that we're doing to live longer and healthier are gonna mean absolutely nothing if we don't keep our brains about us. So estrogen use for a period of 10 years helps reduce Alzheimer's by 83%, but it's worthless with established Alzheimer's disease or dementia. Uh, stroke, uh, at both the hormone replacement arm and the estrogen re replacement arm did demonstrate an increased risk in, in stroke. And that was because of the effect of some of the hormones on some of the clotting factors. Um, you know, hormone replacement is good for the brain, for the est estrogen receptors in the brain, helps prevent foggy thinking, clears your head, helps you feel better about things. But uh, oral estrogen does uh, increase the risk of, of stroke. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, it does demonstrate some protection, you know, 10, 20 years later. But uh, the studies not demonstrate necessarily that estrogen replacement causes Alzheimer's or dementia, but it certainly contributes to, uh, it, it, uh, well, no, I'm, I'm wrong there. It, it doesn't cause it, but it doesn't cure it either. Just like heart disease, it can prevent it if it started at the right time. But if it started too late and you're on the path towards developing dementia, it, it can, it, it's not going to cure that. Uh, cancer, there's a 37% reduction in colon cancer with um, estrogen replacement. The, horm the estrogen replacement alone de uh, in somewhat decreased the risk of breast cancer. And the point I'd like to make here, though, that decrease in cancer for the estrogen replacement arm is over the course of five years. This was a five-year study. So to extrapolate this to your lifetime, if I take estrogen, I'll never develop breast cancer, especially unopposed estrogen. I, that's something to keep in the back of your head because certainly unopposed estrogen is proliferative. Just as I was saying, it needs progesterone to balance it and calm it down. Progesterone is breast protective actually. And um, I would not recommend progesterone, estrogen without progesterone. Uh, with the hormone replacement arm, and this, that's why you see an increase in cancer when the Premarin and the Provera were used because the Provera worked on the uterus but nowhere else. It actually blocked your body's own progesterone receptors so the positive effects of progesterone couldn't be manifest. Uh, with people that were just on estrogen, they have an increase in breast density by about 400%, bloating, fatigue, and a lot of people may not even want to consider hormone replacement because when you have women on some of these hormones, Premarin, Progestin, there's a lot of side effects, a lot of side effects, and eventually they're gonna go off. You know, if this is something that's supposed to be, help me live longer, make me feel better, how come I feel like crap? Um, if, if, so properly done with proper hormones, a lot of times you're not going to experience a lot of those ill effects. So the bottom line, I know I've harped on it a little bit, you know, progestin is the culprit. Uh, synthetic progesterone is what's going to give you cancer. It's mitotic, meaning it stimulates cell growth. It's prothrombotic, meaning it causes blood clots. And, uh, you know, at, in some cases it's been shown to increase breast cancer by eight times. Now we all, everyone talks about hormone replacement and everyone thinks estrogen. 
But it's not necessarily estrogen that's the culprit. It's the progestin. And progestin is not progesterone. Progestin is a synthetic progesterone. And since medroxyprogesterone or Provera is the culprit, you know, the pharmaceutical companies are pretty smart. They came up with another one. They've, they've come up with a couple different progesterones. And they say, well, we've changed this little molecule, so we think this is safer. It causes less water retention, causes less anxiety. But as you saw, as I showed you the difference one little atom can make, you know, the long-term studies aren't in on some of the other synthetic progestins. But I'm not trusting them to be any safer than what medroxyprogesterone itself was. Um, so, I, you know, all this whole deal with bioidentical hormone replacement started around 1985 when a patient of Jonathan Wright, who's a physician up in Washington, you know, was prescribing his Premarin for a patient, and the lady stood up and said, you know what, I'm not a horse. Why are you giving me horse hormones? And, um, and really, you know, once he thought about that, yeah, why am I giving her horse hormones? Well, I'll tell you why you're getting horse hormones. Because pharmaceutical companies cannot patent a naturally occurring substance and sell it and make money on it. So there's no money to be made on giving women bioidentical uh, estrogen or bioidentical progesterone. And you know, prior to 2002, in 2001, Premarin was a $2 billion drug. It was the most prescribed drug in America, uh, $2 billion. That's a lot of money to be made. And with a lot of money can, can be a lot of influence and a lot of advertising. Uh, to change the way people think. You know, unfortunately, doctors a lot of time get a lot of their information from the drug representatives. Here, here's a free chicken dinner. Here's a paper I'd like you to read about the benefits. Uh, thank you very much. And um, when you look at the paper that was handed to the doctor, oftentimes you look, oh, who paid for this study? Oh, it's Wyeth, the pharmaceutical company that makes Premarin. And actually, uh, uh, Senator Grassley, they had an investiga investigative committee looking at all these things, and there were 60 ghost-written papers about the benefits of hormone replacement uh, prior to the Women's Health Initiative study. And ghost-written means uh, the pharmaceutical company hired a company to write a nice paper. They paid off a physician at Harvard or somebody with a big name to put his name at the top, and uh, this shows the benefits. Now, of course, that cast doubt in all the stuff I told you. Oh, well, they said it had all these benefits. And it does, but there were, there were a number of ghost-written papers touting the benefits of hormone replacement when, in fact, they were, you know, a, a, a paper that showed positive effects. Here, read this. A paper that showed negative effects that was paid for by the pharmaceutical company. We'll put that one in the drawer. Nobody needs to see that one. So bottom line is progestin's something to be avoided if you can. Um, Osteoporosis was not directly related or not directly looked into in the Women's Health Initiative, but there was many positive findings concerning osteoporosis. Uh, there was a decrease in the risk of hip fractures by approximately 34 percent, 35 percent, decrease in the risk of 24 percent of other fractures. Osteoporosis is a huge problem. Hip fractures are very common, carrying a first year mortality of 25 to 30 percent and two year mortality up to 50 percent. So, you know, we're always hearing we want to keep our bones strong, take calcium, take magnesium. Really, the best thing you can do to keep your bones strong, progesterone, estrogen, and testosterone. All of those help support your skeletal system. You know, the calcium, magnesium, vitamin D, K2, all those are good. But if you really want to battle osteoporosis, a properly implemented hormone replacement program will take care of that. In addition to some of the other benefits, there was a 35% reduction in uh, new onset diabetes and a reduction in recurrent UTIs as lack of estrogen has a significant impact on the urogenital system. Uh, menopause is a very drying out phenomena. Dry eyes, dry mouth, uh, vaginal atrophy, vaginal drying. So a lot of times in the menopausal period, you have a lot of uh, urinary tract infections, yeast infections. The, the pH of the uh, vagina essentially changes once you lose your estrogen. So you lose the acidic pH which then makes you more prone to having yeast infections because the acidity would kill off any bacteria or any yeast. So there's a lot of urogenital problems and, that occur in menopause, which estrogen actually supports and gets the vaginal milieu back to more normal so that you, you won't suffer some of these consequences. Uh, essentially, the Women's Health Initiative study should not necessarily be extrapolated to younger women or women right at the time of menopause. Uh, it did demonstrate estrogen is beneficial long term, but remember this was a five year study, so five years isn't really long term. Today it seems like it's long term, but we're talking 30, 40 years. Uh, estrogen 
in my opinion, and uh, I think it will be borne out over time, estrogen alone, and it has been borne out if you look at the women's health initiative or the studies over the 33 years that caused all the cases of uterine cancer, estrogen alone is not the answer. Progestin, stay away from it. The American College of Gynecology was, came up with the term, you know, use hormone replacement for the shortest period of time possible at the lowest dose. And that may help with your hot flashes, but it's not going to support your skeleton. It's not going to help with the other positive benefits of hormone replacement. And uh, NAMS, the North American Menopausal Society, said, you know, maybe we shouldn't change the therapy, just keep things as they are. Both of those companies actually are heavily, were heavily supported by Wyeth, who makes Premarin. Now, this is the slide I think every woman who's going through menopause should probably be shown, you know, because oftentimes you're told, oh, you don't want to do estrogen. Estrogen causes cancer. You don't want to do hormone replacement. It's dangerous. This is what happens when you lose your hormones. All of these things, heart disease, strokes, all of them processes of aging, macular degeneration, dry eyes, sleep disturbances, tooth loss, all of this. This all happens as a part of the aging process. Um, some of the beneficial effects of hormone replacement include increased energy and vitality, improved mood, elimination of hot flashes, improvement in sleep. Sleep is huge. Sleep is when you make your growth hormone. If you're not sleeping well, if you're waking up every hour or two, you're not, you're not recuperating like you should every day. Um, these are some of the other parameters that are improved with hormone replacement. Reduced, increased bad cholesterol, excuse me, increased good cholesterol, Decreased bad cholesterol, uh, weight loss, better metabolism of glucose, better metabolism of, of fat, improvement in the blood vessels, in the lining of the blood vessels, uh, reduced Alzheimer's, memory issues, macular degeneration, sleep disturbances. So there's many things to uh, recommend or support the use of bioidentical hormone replacement. So that being said, you know, what's a woman to do? Well, first off, you want to adopt a healthy lifestyle as best possible. And you know, none of us can be perfect. We do the best that we can with the information that we have and uh, maintaining an activity level, exercising, appropriate diet, stress management. Um, and if you're considering hormone replacement, you don't necessarily want to, uh, you have to, there's certain things to consider over the age of 60 or if you have some pre-existing medical problems. Uh, even people with breast cancer, uh, you know, the standard thinking is, oh, we can't give somebody with breast cancer hormone replacement. But there's over 60 studies demonstrating the benefit of hormone replacement for women who've had breast cancer and who are five years out from their breast cancer. So, and actually the women who are on hormone therapy after breast cancer, if they have a recurrence, have a less um, significant form of breast cancer than if they were untreated, the less aggressive form, I guess I should say. Um, uh, as far as hormone replacement is concerned, with estrogen, you want to be bioidentical estrogen. Start early. You can do it via transdermally, transmucosally, which would be vaginally, or orally. Uh, orally would be based primarily on how healthy you are, how good your liver works, or how well your liver works. Uh, daily, bone protection requires certain levels, uh, and certainly certain nutritional supplements will help with some of these problems and issues, too. Progesterone should be given whether you have a uterus or not. And it should be bioidentical progesterone, not synthetic progesterone, because that's where all the risks arise from. Um, it should be given daily also. Uh, as part of your uh, hormonal replacement program, certainly you want to monitor your symptoms, uh, check blood levels, have your annual pap smear, mammograms. Uh, sometimes you have to have an ultrasound if you have recurrent episodes of bleeding. A lot of times with bleeding, that means you're not getting enough progesterone. You just have to increase the progesterone a little bit. Another thing that's also often useful is a 24-hour urine estrogen metabolite. Uh, estrogen is really a generic name. There's tons of different estrogens. And the way we metabolize our estrogen pretty much determines whether we're going to get breast cancer or uterine cancer or ovarian cancer somewhere down the road. So with the 24-hour urine, what you can do, you collect your urine for 24 hours, send it in, and they determine how much like two hydroxyestrone you have versus four and 16. Four and 16 hydroxyestrone estrone are carcinogenic. And if you have a high level of 16 or four hydroxyestrone, you need to get busy to change that ratio. And changing that ratio is purely done on dietary measures. Uh, there's a number of things that one can do with their diet to prevent breast cancer. Um, optimize your vitamin D levels, 60 to 80. Um, DIM and I3C, which are substances which are extracts of cruciferous vegetables. 
Cruciferous vegetables are broccoli, kale, cabbage, collard greens. They have I3C and DIM in them, which help metabolize. They push your estrogen metabolism to 2-hydroxyestrone, which is the non-carcinogenic and protective uh, estrogen. Now, if you have too much 4 or too much 16, then you're looking at a higher risk of, of breast cancer. You know, some other things, iodine helps pr uh, push your estrogen metabolism to estriol, which is a less toxic estrogen. So there are a number of things that can be done to help prevent breast cancer. But, you know, the information that you can glean from getting a 24-hour urine is invaluable. You know, I, I asked a lady once, 44 years old, had a mastectomy and had gone through breast cancer. And, you know, did anybody ever tell you why you got breast cancer? You know, you accept your fate. I got breast cancer. I have to have chemo. Well, you know, if you're young and you have breast cancer, you got another 40, 50 years to live. What's going to happen to the other breast? Uh, you know, we, we pay a lot of lip service to prevention. There's things that we can do to determine not with 100% certainty who's going to get breast cancer and who's not, but to, to determine your risk. Um, so 24-hour urine, urine estrogen metabolism is a good study to do so. Um, so basically, in summary, aging happens to everyone. We all go through it. Uh, but premature aging is not necessarily written in our fate. I mean, there's things we can do to help combat aging and hopefully help improve our lives over the long term. As hormone levels decline, uh, the aging process marches on. You know, there are some things we can do to help replace some of the hormones that will help ameliorate or decrease the rate at which the aging process occurs. So um, that's pretty much it as far as the talk is concerned. And I'd be happy to, you know, even if you have questions on other health issues, I'd be happy to entertain any of those or hormone replacement. But I would encourage you to ask anything that you might, any questions you may have. Yes. Uh-huh. So good. You got an 83% risk of Alzheimer's. And I'm 69. Should I keep on Yeah. You know, that, that, that depends on your philosophy. But if your philosophy is I just don't want to have hot flashes, that's fine because eventually they'll slow down. But, um, yeah, you know, some people make that argument that, that you should be on them forever. And actually some of these studies I, sh I showed you, that's one of the arguments that they state. You should start on them at the time of menopause and be on it forever. Now, you don't have to push it so hard. Um, you know, I say, I try to get people down to the level of a 30-year-old, essentially. But because ideally, that's the point at where you're at optimal health and wellness. Okay, if, I, if I'm still having some of these problems, while I'm on these hormones, should I increase the dosage? Well, I well, 90% of women that are on hormone therapy are not on optimal hormone therapy. <laughs> Their levels are not, you know, if you, a standard menstruating woman has a, a monthly average estrogen level of 140. That's kind of the standard estrogen level in a menstruating woman. You shoot for 50 to 100. You know, you want optimal levels. Progesterone, we make about 20 milligrams of progesterone a day. You want to have a blood level of progesterone at about 10 to 20 to be protective. So if you're still having some hot flashes and things like that, um, it, it, you know, it's, it, you may need a little bit more estrogen or a little bit more progesterone. You know, you don't, when you look at the studies, the bottom line is you want to have as much progesterone as you can. Of course, balanced by estrogen, but progesterone is so protective. Um, breast, any type of estrogen-induced cancer, progestins, progesterone, not progestin, progesterone is very protective of. So, I mean, you might want to talk with your physician and, you know, see if you need a little tweak or, you know, a lot of times as you go through a program like this, Usually, you know, you'll get started, you get a basic hormone panel, see where you are, start on some hormones. A couple months later, check your hormone levels again, and if you're not optimal, raise it up. So it takes a little bit of uh, work. It's not a one-size-fit-all thing, and that, a fit-all therapy. And that's why a lot of times you work with a compounding pharmacy, because there are some bioidentical hormones which are available that are uh, from pharmaceutical companies. Now, I told you earlier that you can't patent bioidentical hormones because they're a naturally occurring substance, and they're not patented. What is patented is the, the delivery vehicle by which they're given, like the Vivel dot. You know, what's patented is the little transdermal delivery mechanism. So that there are some bioidentical um, hormones that are available through, your, um, through the FDA or through your doctor's prescription. And that's, you know, I don't think it's wrong for you to ask your physician uh, could you just put me on a bioidentical hormone, keep me off the Prempro or the Provera or any of the synthetic progestins? Because, uh, you, know, you know, part of my, my role here is I'm, 
really trying to educate more. I'm not saying, hey, come to me. I know all about this stuff. You know, talk it over with your doctor. You know, hopefully more and more physicians will become a little bit more enlightened about this stuff. Because um, as one of the gynecologists said in one of the lectures I attended, you know, I had women coming to me all the time, bringing me their Suzanne Summers books, and I read this in the book, and I read this on the internet, and I thought they were crazy. But eventually, I opened up a book, and I started reading. And the more I read, the more I thought, wow, they were right. And they are. You know, one of the things I was taught in medical school is the patient's usually right. And that's true, too. I mean, you see that over and over. You know, people know if something's wrong with them. And I can't tell you the number of women I've seen who, who know something's not right, and the answer is not Lexapro. I mean, some, I, I know something's not right in me, and I just don't know what it is, and I can't put my finger on it. So um, women know. And, you know, I think the more you can have an open conversation with your patients, and, you know, a lot of people are blinded. I don't, I don't believe in bioidentical hormones. When, when ultimately, does if you believe in bioidentical hormones have any impact on if they work or not? No. You know, that's like saying, I don't believe in the citric acid cycle, or I don't believe in mitochondria. Who cares what you believe? It's, does it work? You know, if you put a bioidentical progesterone in someone's body, and to have someone say, oh, I don't believe in bioidenticals, well, you know, whether you believe it or not, the body knows how to handle it, knows what to do with it. So, in some ways, I think saying, I don't believe, is a way of saying, I don't really know anything about it, and I haven't looked into it. And the same with, there's no, li there's no literature to support that. Because there is. You know, you could have said that some years ago. Well, there's not really literature to support the bioidentical hormones. Um, but the truth is, bioidentical hormones have been with us for millions of years, thousands of years, through our evolution. Our body knows what to do with them. It's the synthetic hormones we should be worried about, really. And one of the comments was, well, do these bioidenticals, do they, do they work as well as the synthetic hormones do? Well, shouldn't that be flipped around? Do these synthetics work as well as the bioidenticals do? So I think as the information gets out there more and more, um, I think this is probably the way it's going to go. You know, if you look at how information is disseminated and information grows, it goes through three phases. The first phase is it's ignored and ridiculed. You know, you're a tree hugger. You're, you're an alternative medicine guy. It's, it's, it's ignored and ridiculed. That's phase one. Phase two is it's violently opposed. You know, oh, no, that's wrong. You can't do that. And we're going to write a letter from the FDA. and We're going to report you to the medical board. And then phase three, it's finally accepted as self-evident. Oh, yeah, we've known that all along. Of course that makes sense. So number one, it's ignored and ridiculed. Number two, violently opposed. And then phase three, when you get through it all, it's accepted as self-evident. We've known that all along. So. Nature versus nurture controversy. What's that? Nature versus nurture right. controversy. Right. And then, you know, prior to the 70s, if you said it's both people, it's like, no, 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 it's this or it's this. Right. You had the two, the two camps. Right. And, and see, now everybody says, well, it's common sense, it's both. Right. It right. Is, you know? Right. And that's the same with, you know, when you talk about natural therapies and stuff, you know, what did we have for thousands of years before the pharmaceutical companies came along? Grandmothers were We sure did, and they work. They work. I mean, that's, I always tell everybody, you got an open wound, put raw honey on it. There's not one bacteria that can live in raw honey, MRSA, any of them. And it has, raw honey has enzymes in it that breaks down all the proteinaceous materials, and it's simple as could be. Raw honey is better than neosporin, polysporin, bacitracin. You have an MRSA infection, rub a little raw honey on there twice a day. So, um, and it's so funny because, you know, I've been telling people that, and I get laughed at on Fox News this week, one of the headlines. Raw honey for treatment of chronic resistant infections. And so I was validated, you know. Um, see, I'm not full of it, really. Now it's accepted as self-evident. So, anyways. Is it time for a commercial? You get raw Okay, yeah, we, we, can have, we can have a commercial. You want to flip the lights back on? I do have a question. Sorry about you. No, I'm done. Sorry about the comment just out of there. But um, about two weeks ago, mm -hmm. and I'd have to hear this and write it down another five times because it was again another study, mm -hmm. and it now is breaking out. You're, you heard it. Yeah. The the age where if you're this age, this gives you this protection, and if you're this age, and you know, I was like, I'm going to have to rewind that and write everything down. What 
What are your thoughts about that new study that came out? Well, that actually was an analysis of the Women's Health Initiative. Okay. And what they were looking at was um, the risk of stroke and breast cancer in people long term. And in the estrogen only arm replacement of the Women's Health Initiative study, it didn't show an increase in breast cancer. It actually showed a little bit of a decrease in breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Now, what they were looking at there was all these years later, um, is there an increased risk of breast cancer as a result of being on that estrogen for five years, or is there an increased risk of stroke? And what that study showed was that for the women that took that estrogen for five years in the Women's Health Initiative, they did not have an increased risk of, stro of um, breast cancer as a result of that. But, you know, they've been off the estrogen now for eight years. This is in 2002. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the risk of stroke after um, taking oral estrogen for a period of time, once you stop the oral estrogen, the risk of stroke goes away immediately. But so does the protective effects of, uh, for the bones. So, you know, I read one of the articles they were talking about, well, you don't really want to start estrogen around the time of menopause because if you have small breast cancer nodules in your breast, the estrogen will stimulate the, the, the breast cancer. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the fallacy and all that and the part that wasn't explained, they're talking about estrogen and progestin. They're not talking about progesterone. So there's so many shades of gray here, and it, it boggles my mind that the people that analyze the Women's Health Initiative and a lot of these studies, they don't distinguish between natural progesterone and progestin. You know, they don't. And, and it's kind of confusing because progestin, progesterone, it's only a couple letters and it all sounds the same. So um, they, never just, they never make that distinction. But there is so, so, so much literature to support the beneficial effect of progesterone. But they don't distinguish that. So yes, what came out two weeks ago was in JAMA and it was a, a look back at those women that were on the oral estrogen. And you know, they stopped it after the five years. They had no increased risk of breast cancer over that time period. But this was now breaking out the ages differently and saying if you take their benefits for these risk factors within this age group and then there are different benefits for these risk factors at different age groups. So I said it was right. very complex. Yeah. It's on the news quickly. Right, right. And my head started spinning right. again. You know? and, well, they were saying that if you, if you don't take estrogen, like, yeah, they did break it out according to people yeah. that continued on, people that stopped, and people that skipped for five years and then started. Mm -hmm. The people that, um, I believe, stopped or, or continued on with estrogen, there were like seven breast cancer cases out of 1,000. People that waited five years and then went back on after menopause, there was four cases of breast cancer per 1,000. Okay. So it, it wasn't huge. But again, what was missing in all of that was progesterone. Um, well, the other issue, and I, I kind of hear you address this some, um, is um, I was on bioidenticals for a while uh -huh. when I lived in Maryland. Uh -huh. And I moved here. Mm -hmm. and. I couldn't get a doctor who would prescribe it. Right. And we found a compounding pharmacy, mm -hmm. but no doctor would prescribe it. Finally, I got a doctor, because I called my doctor in Maryland and said, can you give me these? Right. They said, nope, right. nope, can't do it. That's You're out of state. We can't prescribe it. Yeah. So recently, I took the prescription for this, and the compounding pharmacy here in Salisbury said, we've never seen anything like this. We don't know what to do with it. So talk to people in Concord, mm -hmm. and they could, they wanted to do a, a long survey after talking to me, and I thought, good, where they ask you, you know, your hair and your this and your Right, that. right, right. But the problem is, and I think, you know, like a pharmaceutical conspiracy, insurance won't cover this. No, they won't. Now, they'll pay for a, a prescription for the Stat. synthetic yeah, yeah. all day long. No problem, yeah. Well, especially the women who are needing it, a lot of us are retired, you right. know, maybe on fixed incomes. Right. A hundred plus dollars a month is maybe not doable. Mm -hmm. So we're in this catch-22 right. of the better stuff maybe is what we can't afford. Mm -hmm. So are you thinking it's better to be on none of the synthetics? If, if you can't, you know what I'm asking. Well, you know, you probably could, you probably could get away with taking Tremorin but taking Prometrium with it, or taking progesterone with it. Prometrium is the, the branded, you know, I can write a prescription from Prometrium, you get at CVS. Prometrium okay. is the bioidentical form. Um, 
Oh, yeah. Or, I'm sorry. You're fired. For, for, uh, I'm sorry, I was, I was off track there. I mean, progesterone cream, too, actually. I mean, okay. you, you can get a that. A legitimate company progesterone cream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this isn't garbage. This is good stuff. But that's so just progesterone. That's not mixed with the estrogen. No, no, it's a separate. This is a cream, and uh, you know, it's just 20 milligrams per pump. Essentially, you put it on once a day. But don't you need it together? You do, but not. They don't have to be together. You can take it orally and rub it on your skin. Okay. So you just have to be getting it in some way. Yeah, we have okay. Yeah, I was going to say there are creams that are made with progesterone and estrogen. That's what I took. Mine was mixed together, uh -huh, uh -huh. and it was a cream. That you yeah, a lot of times once you find the dose, you can mix them all together. Now, when you're working with a compounding pharmacy, or but uh, you can buy, you know, you can buy estrogen, you can buy DHEA, which is also a hormone that actually you take you take DHEA, yeah, and he has that. <laughs> DHEA breaks down into estrogen and testosterone, so okay. yeah, and you're you're right. It's crazy. The insurance companies won't yeah. cover this because it doesn't work. There's no such thing as bioidenticals. You know, but they're happy to pay for your statin and your synthetic, your synthetic drug mm -hmm. that kills you. No problem, we'll cover that for you. Exactly. It's, it's criminal, it's like, it's really. It's like not paying for a health club. Don't wait until you get all the disease-related issues to a poor lifestyle, then they have to pay for that. But they won't pay for a nutritionist or a health club. They won't, they won't, it's, it's it makes sad. Makes no sense. Yeah. Yes. Can you, can you take the patient Prescribe the bioidentical. I used to take them, but I had to go out of town to sleep. Well, and I felt so much better. I thought, what's wrong with me? I haven't taken them in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And can you? Uh, I don't love a local person. Can you I do. Actually, I'm the only one here in town that prescribes right. bioidenticals, which is crazy to me. You know, I I became so convinced of the benefit of this. You know, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. But the more I looked into this, I'm actually doing a fellowship with the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. I've completed the hormone optimization course with Neil Ruzier in Utah. And, um, and I've even spoken to some of our gynecologists here. You know, what? <laughs> yeah, this guy, actually, this, this book, uh, How to Achieve Healthy Aging, this is the guy I did a lot of my training with. And he's, he's huge on optimization. Uh, Somebody's going to get one of them. Yeah, it's a, it's a door prize. So... Um, so, you know, I, at one of my conferences, I spoke to a gynecologist from the Mayo Clinic who is also a PhD in organic chemistry. So if, if anybody knows anything about hormones and things like that, I figured this was the guy. So after he gave his talk, I went up and talked to him. He's, actually, his name is Henry Hess. He's written a book, The Seven Steps to the Perfect Menopause. And he said the topic of synthetic hormones never even comes up in his conversation with patients. I thought, well, geez, if that's the truth, that's good enough for this guy. It's good enough for me. I mean, because it's so clear to me, once you actually understand and look and read, this is what we should be doing. So I had a little bit of a struggle. You know, should I move down this pathway? And so maybe this is my midlife crisis. But I think, <laughs> I think it's a good thing. And nobody around here was offering it. And um, so I started, that's how kind of the genesis of the wellness center that I started. I went to Chapman Pharmacy in Canapolis. Uh -huh. Is he the one that still does it from this area? Well... I, I haven't really worked with any of the local pharmacies because I knew when I started this I was going to get a, bu a bunch of kickback. I've already had talks with medical doctors, family practitioners, gynecologists. What are you doing? Who do you think you are? And uh, compounding pharmacies. Why would you use compounding pharmacy? You don't know what you're going to get there. So I work with MedQuest. I'll, I'll write a prescription for any compounding pharmacy you want. Well, but real good at Canapolis. Yeah. I Yes, I should probably go down there and talk to them. I've talked to Moose Pharmacy here, but primarily when I started this, I started writing a script of MedQuest, which is a compound, it's a premier compounding pharmacy in Utah. You know, they have a mail order business, and actually they're cheaper than a lot of the local people because that's all they do. They don't sell statins and antidepressants. They're a, com they're a premier compounding pharmacy. Usually a woman's dose is about 40 to $70 a month. You know, if you include the DHEA, melatonin, thyroid, a testosterone, progesterone, and estrogen. So, yeah, that's nice. Yeah, yeah it's pretty. Yeah, yeah. The pharmacy, I mean, the doctor saved me about $100 because I had to go to Chapman and pay for it. That's all he does is compounding pharmacy. Yeah, if you have a good compounder, you know, because that's always the knock on compounding pharmacies. Well, you don't want to get something from a compound pharmacy. You don't know what, they're, what you're going to get. You know, they're mixing that stuff up in the closet. Well, isn't that the point? But the point is, <laughs> yeah. you wanted to mix it at your ratio. Right. You don't and, want and, to mix it right. somebody else's right. ratio, right? And the, way, the other thing is, um, 
The other thing is you test for what you're getting. You know, how do you know what you're getting? Well, you test, you know, after a couple months. Am I at the right level or not? Mm -hmm. you, Have you? Have you? Yeah, because even the Moose Pharmacy up here, it's actually compounded in college. Right, they build it down there and I have to pick it up here. And the only gynecologist here in town that would work with me is Lynn Anderson. Mm -hmm. And she's not 100% on board, but she's right. pacifying it. Mm -hmm. I know. I, <laughs> I, I, I to see you. I've tried to, I, I, you know, I've tried, I've tried to talk to her a little bit. You know, it's, it's, uh, this could so enhance a gynecologist's practice. The thing is, it takes a little bit of time. It's not like, hey, how you doing? You look good. See you later. Bye. I mean, there's some education involved. And it, it, I've seen a lot of improvement. I think there's a lot of room for more. Sure. Improvement if somebody really would take it seriously. Right, right, so right. That's oh. fine. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I, have, I have, have several issues, but I'm, I saw in there, and I hadn't really thought about it much, but I have a lot of inflammation, a lot of pain mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, associated with more of that type of symptom. I don't really get the hot flashes. So sure. Much, but I get mood swings. I have memory issues. And mm -hmm. Sleep disturbance. Mm -hmm. and I love sex drive. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, what I think you're saying pretty much is if I put myself on something like this, I'd probably see even the pain go away. Is that possible? Yes. I mean, I, I could promise you that, but yeah, certainly. I have an extreme amount of pain. I'm right. supposedly I well, as you say, you may have some fibromyalgia and yeah. you know, chronic fatigue, yeah. but a lot of those things are not just hormonal. There are a lot of mitochondrial dysfunction. There are some certain things, you know, for, for chronic fatigue, um, there's a sugar called D-ribose, which actually helps your body. And, and and you take D I'm out of it, and I did take it for about three days now, and yeah. I hurt so bad. D-ribose, acetyl L-carnitine, yes. magnesium, and CoQ10. Yeah, the CoQ10, D-ribose, acid, yeah. Yeah, and I'm taking all the other ones. Oh, yeah. so, yeah. so hormones would support that. I couldn't say it would necessarily cure it, but those are some of the, that's kind of the formula for chronic fatigue. Actually, I got to let Steve jump in here. I kind of cut him off. No, he knows I come in here all the time, and I divide it to D-ribose. But I, like I said, I, I wasn't able to get here before I now. Yeah. So yeah. I live in yeah. Yeah. No, D-ribose, you know, it's a sugar. Put it in your coffee. It helps your body make ATP, which is what creates energy. So. Right, and I do do you? How much is too much? Five grams three times a day for four to six weeks, and then five grams twice a day after that. So I'm thinking that I'm only most most people aren't taking them. Yeah. One teaspoon three times a day for four to six weeks. Would you say I'm um, again? You said D ribose, C O D ten. Did you say L carnitine? Magnesium and acetyl L carnitine. Acetyl L carnitine. Or L carnitine. Okay. L carnitine only works from the neck down. Acetyl L carnitine covers the whole body. It goes across the blood brain barrier. Uh -huh. Okay, and then. You get that as simply good natural food. That's right. That's right. They have a broad selection. I'm sorry, what did you say? You get that as simply good natural food. <laughs> you know, if somebody can just figure out I buy all these vitamins, what? now I can what? just get them down my throat, then I'd be glad to take all these vitamins. Hey, I got, a, I, got, I got a pitch for you here, too. I just, I just noticed Steve has these in stock today. You know how you're supposed to eat chocolate? It's full of flavonoids, polyphenols, right. all the yeah. good stuff. Yeah. This is what you should be eating. These are cacao nibs. Cacao nibs are the, this is organic raw chocolate. Um, you know, the, the chocolate that we're eating is filled with sugar and milk sugar. and all this junk. Cacao nibs are the cocoa bean busted up, essentially. They taste a little bit like bark. They're not sweet, so they have, you have to pair them with something sweet. Uh, but he's got sweet. But, but, um, <laughs> cane juice, sugar. sugar. I can't have sugar. So, good. Definitely. Um, but the way you use these, sprinkle it on some ice cream, put it in some yogurt. If you really want to jack yourself up in the morning, just grind it up in a coffee grinder and put two teaspoons of it in your coffee with a sweetener. It's chocolate. It makes it a cafe mocha, essentially. But you'll be, you'll be walking quick after a... <laughs> Or you can use the powder. This stuff is really, this is the chocolate you should be eating. You know, oh, I should eat chocolate. They say chocolate's good for you. This is it. So, okay. If we come to you and you do the testing and the evaluation. Uh-huh. Okay, so I'm on, now I'm on any depressant, any inflammatory. Do you take all that into account and then? I try to get you off that stuff. 
Well, that's what I The mean. less drugs, the better. Right. So, so, so you will evolve us from taking these to a good one. Right. I mean, I try. In my opinion, the less drugs, the better. You know, because we have the medicalization of America. And unfortunately, you know, I think a lot of physicians, unbeknownst to them, are, we're now becoming front men for the pharmaceutical company. It's an industry. It's an industry. And unless you jump out of that caterpillar circle and say, what the heck's going on here? You know, and think for yourself, you, you don't realize, you know, you just do it and say, here's a statin, here's a statin, here's your statin. And then after six months on a statin, statins raise your blood glucose. So you go back to see your doctor after you put on a statin, your blood sugar's higher. Oh, geez, you got diabetes now too. You know, I, I mean, so my goal really is to get people off of their drugs. Now, some of them you may need to be on, hypertension drugs, things like that, but the less drugs, the better, personally, is what it is. So is your secretary here to take appointments? Well, say, no, you don't. <laughs> um, this is just me. So if you, if, if you have me treat you, it's me and you. Uh, you know, this is a practice I've set up separate from my own uh, orthopedic orthoped clinic. No, you call, yeah, you call uh, here or you send me an email saying I'm interested and I'd like to talk to you further. And so at, at, the, at the level I'm at right now, it's just me. Because, I, you know, I, I try to separate the wellness practice from the orthopedic practice. So, I mean, that's why it's kind of your personal. It, it's, you know, you're hiring me to cover you for a year or nine months or whatever, whatever you choose to do. So. And in the meantime, if you need anything to fill in, send me <laughs> yeah, That's right. <laughs> yeah. At this point, I'm doing both. Yeah. And yeah. maybe I'm yeah. sexually so uh -huh. I'm not on the medications. I've been very blessed with good health. Yeah. But being 70, you start thinking, I need to stay in this way. So what can you do? Good multi. Well, yeah. Multi probiotics are huge, too, oh, actually. Yes. We didn't talk about probiotics, but... You know, probiotics are the good bacteria that line your intestinal tract. We are assaulted with synthetic chemicals, garbage, all the time. So probiotics are something that really all of us should be taking daily. It means pro-life. Yes, pro probiotics, pro life. Anti-means. Anti-means, yeah. I just heard that the other day. Yeah, yeah. So, so pro, um, probiotics are a good thing you should take every day. A, mul a good multivitamin. Uh, you know, if you want to go the hormone route, 25 milligrams of DHEA would be a safe dose. Uh, we'll usually postmenopausal 25 to 50. You could get, okay, so multivitamin, vitamin D, typically I'll recommend 2,000 to 5,000 I use a day. Uh, you know, you, you would like to have your vitamin D level tested, 60 to 80 is optimal. Um, DHEA, I feel safe, you know, again, I'm not your treating doctor, so, and I'm not supposed to be giving any medical advice, but 25 milligrams there, How, how's that? <laughs> I shouldn't give any medical advice, no, write this down and take this. Um, <laughs> So usually for a postmenopausal woman, 25 milligrams a day. You know, premenopausal, 10, 15 maybe. Too much DH, DHEA will give you acne, may make you a little aggressive. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe, some, maybe some chin hairs. So, so. There are resources for these supplements and things are reliable, they're reliable as well. Because that some of the doctors even write some of these supplementation books and, and informational tools that we have. So. You have all that at your disposal as well. Um, so D, multivitamin, probiotics, fish oil. Fish oil. Central fatty yeah. acid. Fish oil, yeah. yeah. That, that's kind of a basic, you know, what can I do? Stay melatonin. Now, melatonin is outstanding. Uh, melatonin not only helps, it's, it's not ambient, it's not Lunesta. Melatonin deepens your sleep, especially stage three and four REM sleep. It's, that's when you make growth hormones. So melatonin, it's not addictive. And melatonin is one of the most powerful antioxidants there is, protects against breast cancer. That's why women who work the third shift, whose circadian rhythm is messed up, have a 40 to 60% increased risk of breast cancer. So everybody should be taking melatonin after the age of 35 to 40, because that's when you start, stop making melatonin. Uh, three, usually three milligrams, to, you know, you can start with one if you want to go slow and taper it up, but three milligrams to six milligrams, I usually recommend the sustained release. And you get it, it's simply good. That's true. <laughs> Everything I'm telling you now is it's from simply good natural foods. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a good, but I, I, think, I think melatonin is great. It's not addictive. It's not like you won't have trouble coming off of it. You can take it one night and not take it the other. So. If you're perimenopausal, is the DHEA good? Uh, well, it, it can break down. If you're perimenopausal, I would use this um, day, day 15 to 25 of your cycle. Because that's when you make progesterone. Okay. And if you're perimenopausal and you're having issues, 
um, I would use that for you know day 15 to 25 of your cycle because that's when your progesterone levels should be up. And you probably will notice a difference. You, know, you rub it on your chest, your arm, uh, wherever, and it uh, it's good. You can use you know you can use it once or twice a day. I feel I don't have any serious reservations about recommending progesterone to women because I know how safe it is and how beneficial it is. You will not catch me standing up here saying rub this progestin cream on because that, that's, that's, that's basically saying here use this and get cancer or blood clots. You have to watch out for that if you don't stick with a reputable company like it's presented here because mm -hmm. there are some that aren't that aren't actually Yeah, and, and um, progesterone, you know, if you're menopausal you don't want to just take progesterone. You still make some estrogen. Actually that's why women gain 10 or 15 pounds of belly fat when they get, go through menopause. Since your ovaries aren't making progesterone anymore, you lay down a little fat, and the fat makes estrogen. So that's your source of estrogen, that and your adrenal glands. That's why a lot of times women will gain weight right at menopause. So then what do we do? So then what do you do? <laughs> Bioidentical hormones. <laughs> you know, you supplement with estrogen, your body doesn't have the demand to make it. And, uh, you know, but hormone, repla hormone replacement doesn't make you lose weight, but it will help you... Um, I mean, it, it, it's not an automatic, hey, I'm starting on hormones, I'm going to lose 10 pounds. Right. you still got to work at it, but it will make things function and work better, really. So, yes? I want to ask this question because maybe somebody else has had breast cancer in the past. Uh -huh. For me, it's been 22 years, no recurrence, praise God. Yeah. What, if anything, can I do to prevent any cancer in the future? You sound like a plant. <laughs> that was a, that's a perfect question. I got the, I have the answer for you. No, I mean like you were planted in the audience to no, ask me that. Yeah, that. yeah. Well, you know my little breast cancer recommendation. You should have a 24-hour urine estrogen for estrogen metabolites to see how well you're doing. A 24 what? 24-hour urine estrogen metabolite Where do I analysis. Get that? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's usually done from Genova Diagnostics. I don't know if any of the gynecologists or family practitioners here. Here, yeah, yeah, that's a that's a useful test because that will help determine your risk for breast cancer. Or, but the recipe that I typically give people for breast cancer is vitamin D levels, 60 to 80, um, natural progesterone. I'm a big proponent of iodine. Uh, iodine, when you have breast cancer, your uh, iodines can be used to help treat breast cancer. But um, you know, iodine taken prop if taken too much can impact your thyroid though too, so you gotta be a little careful there. But iodine helps kill breast cancer cells. If you can see some of the, the cytologic studies, the cell studies showing women have had breast cancer and what the iodine does to the cancer, it's well, amazing. Can I get breast cancer again? I had Oh, bilateral? Yes, sir. Oh, well, not likely. Not likely, not likely. But I'm sorry, I didn't mean I'm to sorry, I thought I was just, yeah. I've, I've had vasectomies, 22 years, uh -huh. survivor, praise God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so is there a chance I could get cancer anywhere else? Well, the one thing that, as soon as you said I've had bilateral, that, make, that makes me wonder, yeah. I bet you she's estrogen dominant. I bet That's, she's got too much estrogen yes, going on. My cancers were estrogen fed. I yeah. had, I had, um, uh, uh, they said it was rare at that time, I don't know. Uh -huh. uh, 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 Locular carcinoma, 85% of the women who had it in one breast to get it in the other, and I was in that group, unfortunately. Yeah. Oh. You, you may have too much estrogen. So, well, I mean, you probably don't have too much estrogen, but you have, you may have had too much estrogen that then caused that. Yes, yes. So, I mean, controlling estrogen, cruciferous vegetables, DIM and I3C, that's part of the breast cancer. Yeah, D, natural progesterone, iodine, DIM and I3C, flax seeds, which you grind up because you can't yeah. digest them if you just eat them whole, and um, probiotics and essential fatty acids. That's kind of the things I would recommend to help battle or decrease the risk of breast cancer, really. And you know, iodine, for women with cystic problems, cystic ovaries, cystic breasts, a lot of times they recommend putting iodine on those areas, because that iodine helps, after a three to six month period, help decrease fibrocystic breast disease. Um, I wish I'd known that before I had my lungs removed, because yeah. I have that. Where do you see the patients, since you said you like to keep it separate, you don't see it? I see them at my office. At the same office? Yeah, yeah, not, not as, you know, and I'm seeing patients with hip fractures and broken wrists, I don't squeeze you in there at that point. I mean, I usually see you after hours because it takes a little talk time and so in my office. You know, maybe you just missed your calling. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, this, uh, you no, probably, he I'm, is, he is a great orthopedic guard. Oh, I'll do too. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, this excites me. You're 
you know, know, I'm sure you probably couldn't tell that. Your phone's going to be ringing off the phone. Well, it's... Well, you know, there comes a point in your life where you think, this stuff has to be out there. Yeah, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, I, I joke to my, my wife talking about this. You know, I mean, all of you guys are here today. And you probably know I'm a bone doctor, but you're still here. <laughs> that, that speaks volumes about the information, the thing. You know, the more information you have, the better. <clears throat> and, and see, that was a little stickler for me. You know, should I do this? Is anybody even going to believe me? Well, I think once you get out there and you teach people the things you know and the things that are out there. And I'm not making this stuff up. You know, this isn't opinion. This stuff is all validated and backed up by scientific research, most of it which has not been paid for by the, paid, bought and paid for by the pharmaceutical companies. So. See, I'm, I'm a hypothyroid. Uh-huh. And Centroid is the only thing I take. Mm -hmm. So far, I'm going wood. I may be on antidepressants next week. But right now, Centroid's on taking and I'm 58. Yeah. Is, I was just reading over the thyroid portion of it. Is there something for that? I don't use Synthroid. No. Because Synthroid's T4. And Synthroid's what you get from mainstream medicine. And the active thyroid hormone in the body is T3. T3 is what makes your body work. T4 is the storehouse for thyroid. So they give you T4 just assuming, well, she'll convert it to T3. Well, what if she doesn't have enough selenium? And she's not going to convert it very, you know, there's, so, I mean, I usually use compounded thyroid, which is T4, T3 combination. Okay. So, because you can talk to a lot of people that are on Synthroid and they still feel awful. Mm -hmm. And then you put them on a little bit of, of compounded T4, T3. You don't want to give too much T3, because then you get palpitations, nervousness, anxiety, sweating. Mm -hmm. But talk about elevating someone's sense of well-being. Um, iodine stimulates thyroid production, too. Sometimes you can take people off thyroid, uh, um, um, Synthroid and just put them on iodine. That's, you know, it takes a little time to work that out. But, um, so there's some things that you can do to support your thyroid. Our, th our thyroids are under assault. Soy, which is heavily promoted, soy is a goitrogen. It causes thyroid problems. Uh, and there's soy everywhere in our diets, uh, most of it genetically modified soy. Now, the soy that all the Japanese eat, because the Japanese are healthy, they live longer than us, they have some of the highest longevity. Much of the soy they eat is fermented soy, tempeh, miso, soy sauce. Um, we eat a lot of fabricated soy. If you were to look deeply into the soy issue, you'd think twice about eating soy. Soy is, you know, in, in the wild, the animals don't eat soy. So, uh, soy has been kind of put out there too much as being a positive thing, and it's really, I'd rather you drink almond milk than soy milk any day of the week, honestly. So. What can you come talk to us about next Saturday? Well, <laughs> you know, actually, May 7th, I'm giving a green smoothie talk up here. And talk about a way to get your cruciferous vegetables. Because, you know, when's the last time you ate a pound of spinach with raw? Right. You put a couple mangoes in there, a couple bananas, uh, a little fish oil, and, and it's, it's a great way to get your greens, the things that you need to eat, whole foods. May, May 7th. 7th. May 7th. It's simply good natural foods. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The cacao nibs? Yeah, for me. You know what? Maybe for that talk, I'll grind up a bunch of cacao nibs in my coffee grinder at home and put them out there. And then you can try it out. And then you'll be jumping all over the place while I'm giving my talk. So. <laughs> or there's cacao powder, too, actually. Yeah, it's pretty ground. Would, yes. you, would you open a bag for us so we can try it out there with the nuts? Open the sweet bag. You know, I'm telling you, just the raw cacao, you're not going to like no. it. you got to mix it with some raisins. You can make trail mix. And actually, he has trail mix with cacao, goji berries, and golden okay. seeds. TSH. Well, <clears throat> yes, yeah, they say um, some greens are goitrogenic, meaning that they interfere with the absorption of iodine, which then make you hypothyroid. Um, so you should never eat greens. <laughs> no, I, I mean, honestly, that's, some greens are considered to be goitrogenic. So the answer to that, when you make your green smoothie, put a couple drops of iodine in your green smoothie. Uh, um, well, you know, I don't, that's what they say. Some greens are goitrogenic. But there's, there's some big studies on it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's raw versus cooked and things like that. 
Yeah, yeah. I would not uh, dissuade you from eating greens because they might shut your thyroid down. I would dissuade you from eating soy because that might shut your thyroid down. Not shut it down, but inhibit or impair it. So, um, but yeah, elevated TSH means hypothyroidism. That's a crazy thing to me too. When we try to evaluate people for their thyroid function, we don't measure their thyroid hormone. We measure the hormone that stimulates their thyroid gland. Why not measure the actual thyroid hormone? <laughs> that, that's what I do, but yeah. Yeah, that's an easy thing. And I will tell you this, speaking of if you're iodine sufficient or not, the other way to test for iodine, there's actually a new test that came out recently, but it's it a 24-hour urine. You take 50 milligrams of iodine before you do the 24-hour urine, and then you see how much you excrete. If you excrete less than 90% of that iodine, that means you're iodine insufficient. And I can tell you of the over 5,000 people that have taken that test, 96% of the population is iodine deficient. Iodine used to be in salt. And what do you hear? Don't eat salt. Um, and iodine used to be in flour. Iodine used to be in a lot of things. Now it's been replaced by bromine. Well, if you look at the periodic table, you have bromine, fluoride, and chloride, and then iodine. So all of the fluoride, bromine, and chlorine are what are called toxic halides, and they displace iodine. And there's fluoride in our water. So the more fluoride, chloride, and bromide you're getting, the less iodine you're getting. And iodine needs to be on every cell in the body. If you don't sweat, that's a sign of iodine sufficiency. Iodine insufficiency is the number one cause of mental retardation worldwide. Uh, so in Japan, they had this nuclear meltdown, but they're a little bit sa they're safer over there because they take in 13.8 milligrams of iodine a day from all the sea vegetables that they eat. Um, so iodine's huge. And as far as hormone replacement, if you don't have iodine, it may not work as well for you. Uh, a lot of times if you're trying to scratch your head, how come our levels aren't going up? What's going on? Let's try on some iodine, and that can fix things. Do you want to give, a, you want to give something away? Cheryl Vanderpool. All right. Does it have caffeine? No, it doesn't. It has theobromine in it. It's caffeine. Uh, yeah, actually, if you want me to be honest with the cacao, um, cacao has theobromine, uh, phenylethylamine, and anandamide. And anandamide is actually a chemical that stimulates the, the marijuana receptors in your brain. So don't tell the government they'll stop selling that stuff. But um, that's kind of what I, I'm telling you. If you, if you, you don't want to overdo it on the cacao because it'll, it'll make you a little jittery. But, but it, it, uh, it really... It enhances the caffeine experience of coffee, for sure. Um, so, it, but yes, the, now, now theobromine is not absorbed as quickly as caffeine does. Caffeine will give you a rush, and uh, theobromine is a little bit more stabilizing, and it releases the caffeine more slowly. So if the doctor said no caffeine for me, you can't have that. Well, I guess I should say yes. <laughs> I mean, uh, if they, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you have atrial fibrillation or coronary or, or some type of thing that'll, uh, then yes, if that's what your doctor says, then yes, you should do it. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> maybe just a little. Um, Wanda Barry. Wanda Barry. There you go, Wanda. So that's a that's a pretty decent book, actually. Actually, another book that that I recommend to people. Um, this book, you know, I, had, I also recommend The Natural Superwoman. That's a little cheaper than some of the other books, but that's really a good book that talks about all natural hormone replacement. This is another one um, by Fooley Cohan's lay's name, The Natural Hormone Makeover. Both of these books are written by MDs, and they're, um, they cover the whole spectrum of what I just talked about, essentially. Uh, they're quite good. You know, I, I, I sometimes hesitate to mention Suzanne Summers because as soon as you mention Suzanne Summers, everyone labels you as a quack. Right, right, right. Don't tell me about Suzanne Summers. What does she know? Well, in fact, it's, it's not her writing her diary. She's out interviewing doctors who are on the cutting edge doing this stuff. And she's, 
it, it was so funny because at one of my conferences, I went to eat lunch and I'm sitting at the bar eating a hamburger and I'm talking to a general surgeon from Michigan who also was at the conference. And he asked me, he's like, have you read Suzanne Summers' book? And I, I said, that was kind of hard for you to ask me, wasn't it? <laughs> and, he said, and he said, yeah, yeah, it was. But uh, so, you know, her books are good too, but in order to keep myself from being discredited as a quack, these books are, are, are good too. You know, Uzi Reese, this fully caught in the natural hormone makeover, all of those detail a little bit about what this is about. And who's that author again? It's, it's Fuli Cohan, P-H-U-L-I. It's an unusual name. Cohan, C-O-H-A-N. She's up in, I believe, Massachusetts. Yeah. Tell them about the... Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 grandfa the grandfather of bioidentical hormones is John Lee. John Lee and Jonathan Wright. You know, what your doctor may not tell you about menopause, there's also what your doctor may not tell you about perimenopause, and what your doctor may not tell you about breast cancer, all of which are quite good books. But John Lee was a big, huge progesterone advocate. You know, there's estrogen. We're being attacked with estrogens every day. Phytoestrogens, which are soy. Xenoestrogens, which is anything made from petroleum, like this plastic. Uh, that's why you're seeing men's testosterone le levels go down to nothing, because all the plastics in the... We live in a very estrogenic society. Uh, everything... You know, estrogen's all over the place, and your body doesn't care where it came from. So that's why we're all, you know, once, once you hit menopause, you pretty much stop making progesterone. So you could get by maybe just with using progesterone and no estrogen at all. But um, sometimes if you just have estrogen alone, it can't stimulate. Um, it, it's got to be a balance. It's got to be a little progesterone and estrogen. It says Liz. Oh. Who's Liz? I'm Liz. Hey, Liz. Yeah, you want something. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, women's mold time. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much. Any other? Scarlet speeches. But she's oh. not here, so she. Oh, she left oh. early. She missed out. I know. May I ask another question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. I please. realize we're here as a women's issue, right. but you just mentioned this. Yeah. Um, what would you use to replace testosterone? My husband can't take shots, he can't do the cream, he can't do the pills. He's having an allergic reaction to all of those, and his testosterone levels are extremely low. He drinks bottled water all the time. So when you just said that, I went... BPA. Watch out for BPA. BPA. Bisphenol A. It's, it lines inside lining of cans, it's in plastic bottles, shuts down your... But what would I use for testosterone? He can't take shots? Nope. What? He gets um, he, it, red, swollen, hot, inflamed, allergic reaction to it. Was that commercial or is that compounded? Uh, it's whatever his doctor gave him. It's not, it's the commercial, I guess, testosterone. Yeah. And then they just tried the cream. What's Skin breaks out, rash all over. Needs tried iodine. the pills. So he cannot do yeah, well, Pills can be toxic to your liver. Um, I'd try a different form of the shot, really. I mean, the shot, there's a couple ways you can do the shot. I am, you know, right in your muscle. Or you can just do it sub Q, pinch some fat and inject it. He's, um, uh, now, he, they've tried like three of the shots. And I mean, he'll get a place like this. It gets swollen. It's hot, hot, hot to the touch, and it's red. So he, his body is not liking the testosterone. Yeah, I would, I'd probably work on his inflammation a little bit then. Because why, why is that happening? Yeah, why is he having an allergic response? I'd start him on some probiotics and... Uh, some uh, essential fatty acids. Anything, you know, inflammation is the root of disease. It's not cholesterol. Inflammation is the root of yeah. the diseases we face. What increases inflammation? Stress, sugar. The average person eats about 170, 200 pounds of sugar a year. So, um, and a lot of these autoimmune conditions you're seeing, more and more people developing lupus and scleroderma and all this. A lot of that's estrogen mediated. Too much estrogen, too little progesterone. It's got to balance out. Oh, yeah, most people are. There, if you want to get it in Xerox for your patients, uh -huh. there was a Time Magazine article. It was a cover a couple of years ago. Silent inflammation, the body there with the big yes. flame. And it was amazing for a lay person. Uh -huh. because, um, and the diagrams, I loved it because I could understand it. So I thought that would be something great, especially with you being more holistic. Oh, so sure. Half for people if you wanted to Xerox it or yeah. tell people about at the library. Right. And isn't it sad, you know, you said I'm more holistic. Isn't it sad that you even have to label it as that? Oh, you, you know what I mean? Yes. It's alternative. It's holistic. Yeah. It's the way it should be. Yeah, it is. You, you, know? you know, my doctor's in Maryland, and I wait on average three hours to see them. Uh -huh. And I was 
I didn't grumble about it because they were the MDs, in a yeah. but they are holistic and in their approach. Now they'll give you an antibiotic. Sure, you know, sure. But they're gonna, you know, they're the ones where I learned a lot of this stuff, mm -hmm. and then I did a lot of research on my own. But you can't find, you can't find doctors like this. You can't. And you know, it, it's difficult. So um, right. I'm thrilled to hear about you. Well, it's, it's, it's stepping out of line, you know. One guy made the, the analogy as physicians were a bunch, we're in the caterpillar line. It's a big circle, and we're all following each other, and who's in the front, and who's in the back, and who's in the front, and who knows? This is what we do. Well, it's and also on the patient's side when you come in to a doctor and say, you know, because um, I was the only person in Maryland who had, there was a place in West Virginia who uh -huh. had um, hormone and antibiotic free meats. Yeah. And so we would ride kind of halfway to each other. And yeah. I mean, I was paying five sixty nine a pound for bone in chicken uh -huh. in the eighties. Yeah. But you know, okay. So you're you're How you're weird then, that? aren't you? Yeah. I'm what? You're weird then, aren't you? I am you? weird. You know, my my uh, this receptionist said to me a while ago because I found out about this place that has the hormone and antibiotic um, turkeys and things, uh -huh. and she said, you know, it's just becoming in the forefront, and I thought, no, it's just getting more publicity. There have been people like us. Yeah. But <laughs> I, 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 people, I, we need a support group for people I, like you. I would you. like to ask women, well, anybody here, because I've had discussions with a lot of people about this, and we're, we're all kind of agreeing. Okay, those of us in this, not you, you're out of this discussion. But those of us in the certain age group, I'm 58, do you remember when you were in school and it was the anomaly to see a big busted girl? And most, you know, A's, B's were kind of typical. I go to the mall now, and this just isn't now, for years, and I'm looking and I'm going, C's, D's, double D's, and these girls are not having breast augmentation at 15, 17. So I'm sitting there going, okay, we have hormones, steroids, antibiotics in our milk, mm -hmm. our beef, our chickens, and whatever the animal ingested or is in the egg and the milk, we are ingesting. Yeah. So I'm looking, thinking, you know. And we're wondering it? why our daughters who are 10 years old are starting their right. period. Exactly. So, am, so am I, I'm not the only person. They put estrogen patches on cattle to beef them up. Yeah. Well, in the same thing, you know, with the chick carbohydrate diet. Mm -hmm. I know yeah. chicken breasts look like turkey breasts now. Well, because, and, so and then they have to give them all the hormones and antibiotics because they're stuffed in pens yeah. and they're full right. of filth. So. 80% of the antibiotics used in this country are, are used for livestock. In the animals. Not yeah. for people, for livestock, yes. Yeah. So. Melinda what? Red Riot. Red Riot. Red Riot. Oh, bread riot. Bread, like I, yeah, I, I have. I have. I'm not riot terribly. Local um, conglomeration of farms and, and growers. Yeah. 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 And it's local, you yeah. I mean, trying to get back to whole foods. Right. Um, you know, the less pesticides, the less. Red riot. There's a group here, isn't Jane there? Lance. Yes, it's a small Yeah. Jane yeah. <laughs> Except for my book, I need to keep it. <laughs> Yay! Any other questions or anything? Yeah. I said this is a year to younger remember that. Every what? What part of your cycle do they occur on? They occur in the second half? Oh, okay, okay. But I don't know, see, I don't, I'm also back in thyroid. Uh-huh. I don't know which one has thrown me into early menopause. Uh-huh. Well, I mean, yes, menstrual migraines oftentimes are a progesterone deficiency. So uh, for, a woman, for a woman who doesn't have a period, but she's still, she still may be making some estrogen. I don't know if you have your ovaries or not. But if, I mean, if you've had a hysterectomy, you kept your ovaries. And that's another paradox. You know, well, you've had a hysterectomy. Let's keep your ovaries so you can keep your hormones, which is good because you need hormones. But then they turn right around and say, oh, when you hit menopause, you don't need hormones. Hormones will give you cancer. But anyways, a lot of times menstrual migraines are progesterone deficiencies. So it might help to try some of the progesterone cream if you can kind of figure out when those, 
you know, because ultimately when you're taking progesterone and, the, and you're still making hormones or your ovaries are still functioning, you really want to just take the progesterone day 15 through 25 or 12 through 26, somewhere in that second half because the first half of your cycle, menstrual cycle, you're, there's no progesterone. Then the second half, that's when the progesterone goes up. The progesterone, progesterone means progestational. It supports pregnancy. Um, and so the progesterone level goes up to nurse the endometrium to get ready for the implantation of the egg. If the egg doesn't implant, then uh, it drops. And that's why periods start, because you've, your progesterone drops. So if you were to use progesterone cream day 15 through 25, two or three days after, you, after day 25, the progesterone's been withdrawn, that's when your period starts. So progesterone is, uh, that, that's common with, with headaches. Though. Uh huh. And it just seemed like from then on, iodine. Nothing was right. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, so did they take the whole ovary? No. Okay. Yeah, but you know, even when you get in there and you muck around, that ovary may die a little sooner and may not function. You you need your ovaries to make progesterone essentially. Once your ovaries are gone, you're not making much progesterone. The other thing with progesterone, progesterone is a precursor for cortisol. Cortisol is the stress hormone. So a lot of times you get what's called a progesterone steal. Even though you're making progesterone and it's supposed to have all these positive beneficial effects, if your body's stealing it to make cortisol because you're always under stress, then you're not getting the positive effects of progesterone. So that's called a progesterone steal, and that happens especially as stress is increasing more and more. You were saying, because I've had the partial hysterectomy, I don't have my uterus, but I do have my ovaries. So if you take the progesterone, then how would you know? Because I don't know what my. Do you think? Well, do you think you're menopausal or? I know I am. They tested my ass. Oh, so you're menopausal? So I'm, I'm, I'm like right at the cusp. I think I think they said I was like 113 or something like that on my SSH. Oh, your FSH? FSH. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. You're fine. Yeah. So you take it every day. Okay. So it's, it's when you're cycling that you take it okay. day 15 through 25. I just wanted to make sure that I, I was following. I was like, oh, No, no, no. If you're, if you're. So that's you know, why it didn't work for me before when I was menstruating because you have, you can only see that's what I do. Well, it's best to take it during the time when it should be. You know, really, in all this stuff, if you want to cut this down to the quick and make it simple, do what nature does. Follow what nature does, you know, as far as the, the cycling and stuff. Now, the counter to that is after you're menopausal, progesterone is so protective, what days of the month do you not want to be? What days of the month do you want to be without it? So you probably have some progesterone steel. Probably. Um, so, I know I do. <laughs> so, you know, really, if, if, we, if we copied what nature does, you know, in nature, there's no, there's no room for us taking horse estrogen to make ourselves feel well. We'd want to use hum, human estrogen, yeah. wouldn't you? Yeah. So, um, I mean, if, bottom line is if you copy nature, you're probably going to be in much better shape than if you try to alter it because, right. you know, Somebody else had a question. Vicki Reinsel. What is that? Chia seeds? No, that's uh, organic greens. Organic <laughs> greens. That's a good way to get your. Uh... <laughs> Broccoli. Breast cancer. This kid is looking about detoxing. Get your liver cleaned up. You know, in a lot of societies, the liver. As we have the heart, you know, for Valentine's Day, we have the heart. A liver wouldn't look good on the front of the card. But, um, like in Chinese medicine, the liver is huge because the liver does so many things. It detoxifies, it cleans us out. We're assaulted with toxins so much, sometimes our liver gets overrun, it gets backed up, we get gallstones. Um, so, the, you know, the more you can kind of keep your liver clean, and there's some supplements that help with that. Milk thistle is one of them. Uh, curcumin is a very good uh, supplement, too, herbs. What's that? Curcumin. Curcumin. It's from turmeric, the Indian spice turmeric. Okay. Look that up online and then you and think to yourself, geez, why, why haven't I been taking this? Because that's supposed to be. Curcumin right. prevents cancer, it's Alzheimer's, good thing. If you've never detoxified or cleansed your liver out, I recommend it everybody. You recommend what? So what, what would liver, you recommend? A good liver cleansing detoxification. I have some. Well, one day though, you'll probably get a headache. Yeah, you, yeah, you don't feel yeah. too good while you're doing it. But afterwards, you're feeling a new So you want to make sure that you don't have to go to work. If your liver is functioning optimally, 
you'll be healthy for a long time. I mean, you need your liver to break down your estrogen so you don't get breast cancer, essentially. Uh, but, you know, the probiotics there, too. Is, so, but milk, milk thistle is another supplement that you can take that helps clear out your liver. Um, and I guess that stuff that you have has milk thistle in it, then. I bet you it does. Milk thistle, you know, I don't know what you learned, but it's really a restorative mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not a cleansing. Dandelion, artichoke, turmeric, like we said, perfume. Those are cleansing, detoxifying herbs. Milk thistle is more restorative, restorative effect. Well, how is that different to probiotics? Well, probiotics are actually bacteria that live in your gut. And, you know, um, probiotics, they make your vitamins. They, they break down your food. So... Uh, probiotics are, you know, you should have a, a ratio of 85% good bacteria to 15% bad bacteria. If you have an imbalance, you can get candida, chronic yeast infection, yeast overgrowth, all of which leads to a lot of problems. That's a, that's a highly overlooked medical problem a lot of people have, chronic fatigue, recurrent yeast infections. If you're someone who has recurrent yeast infections, you need to clean your GI gut, your gut bacteria up. I mean, probiotics is helpful, but there's also treatments for candida, oregano oil, and a number of different things. Candida is hard to clear up, but you got to have the proper balance of your get. It's uh, a parasite, mainly. It's a yeah. black walnut, polyarco, and those all. Things. Yeah, I mean, um, so we all have candida in our system, but if you get candida overgrowth, that causes a lot of problems, too. Was that something you would take, like, once a month, or? Well, probiotic. Uh, probiotic. Well, yeah, you know, probiotic. daily. I mean, some people say you can cycle them. Depends on your diet and your healthy lifestyle, but a probiotic's a good thing to take really daily. I mean, some of the mentors and the training I've been in say, everybody needs a probiotic every day. Um, well, over age 50, it's really beneficial to, to replace and replenish the, bif the bifido because the bifido, yeah. after age 50, that's one of the types of bacteria, bifidobacterium. So it's like everything else. Yeah, it goes down here. You want to optimize it. The funny thing is, is if you look, there's a lot of probiotics out there right now. Activity is not. Uh, and which counter, counterbalances what you're trying to do because sugar will help the yeast grow. Yeah. So it's better to take it in pill form the probiotics. Yeah, you know, yogurt doesn't have enough probiotic. That, that's a marketing tool, but yogurt does not, not have enough probiotic to really okay. suit your needs. Yeah, like I said uh, in the last talk, you've got to eat a bowl this big. Do you, do you sell Dr. O'Hara's probiotics? Yeah. Dr. O'Hara? Yeah, do you? Yeah. Dr. O'Hara is probably one of the premium probiotics. He was one of the, yeah. 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 It's a Japanese, um, he's a Japanese PhD, and actually he cultures his probiotics in big, huge vats for three years, and included in his probiotic or prebiotics, which are the food that the probiotics eat to stay alive. And uh, Dr. O'Hara is a good one. Renew Life is a good one. Uh, Udo's, but uh, Dr. O'Hara's probiotics are one of the premium ones, really. And they're, they're, that's good you sell those. That's a good probiotic. You know, that's what people know about it. Yeah. Now they do. Yeah. yeah. Good job. Right. We just finished week two when you had liver cleanse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Should we go all the way through the, the plan to the, you know, the, the end of it at the end of three months before we, you know, try the, the, the biosynthetic? No, no, no. You, you could, I mean, we could or start. That, could that be done any time? That could be done any time, but yeah. It's hard to throw too many things at a person at once. I always feel terrible, not terrible, but when I'm getting people set up on a plan, it's a lot. Okay, now we're, you know, oh, I'm totally healthy. What can I do to stay healthier? Well, here, here's five things you need to take. You know, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. And so there's so many working parts of that, but you could. You, you could. I mean, I, I'd get through the low calorie part and then start in the, <laughs> after that. When we talk about these things, like Dr. Navy says at the beginning, stress management is really a key. He can give you a lot of things to do, but if you worry about them constantly, it's going to just you know, not be beneficial at all. So take a few things, take them in stride, just, you know, go with those at the so. I got to share with you a new toy I just got this week, actually. <laughs> it's, called a, it's, it's called a Fitbit. It's a little thing. You, it's like a pedometer, but uh, what it does, you know, you want to get 10,000 steps a day. That's kind of a measure of your health and wellness. But this little thing tells you how many steps you're taking, how many calories you've burned, and then when you, you wear it on a little sleeve at night, and it tells you, how many minutes it took you to fall asleep, how many times you woke up, your sleep efficiency. Wow. And, and like, la so last night, I was in bed for eight hours and 12 minutes, but I slept for seven hours and 38 minutes, and I woke up 11 times. And, uh, and, and, and 
you, you know, you just wear it on your pocket. You walk by your computer, and it downloads all the information into the computer. It's called a Fitbit. You can look it up at Fitbit.com. I mean, it, it's a hundred bucks, but it's it's really a neat thing. I mean. Yeah, you, yeah, you want to, but the thing for me is, I look at it and like, I've only walked 7,300 steps today. I got to get moving. And the nice thing about it, it, it gives you a little flower. And as you walk more steps, your flower gets bigger. So, you know, I mean, it's, but it's, it's, it's really, you know, it's a pedometer. It tells you how many calories you burn. Tells you how, um, so, so far I've taken 1,620 steps today. I've walked three quarters of a mile. I've burned 1,300 calories and my flower is little. No, but but, but fit, <laughs> Fitbit.com. I just want to make a comment uh, because I've been uh, in the Bahamas for about 10 years, but you know, everybody's always collecting to prevent, to prevent this disease, prevent that, give money, give money, cure it, excuse me, not prevent, cure it and cure it. And, cure yeah. it. and there is a, there's a need for that, for cure for various things and diseases, and there's a time and place for medicines and, of course, balance some of our natural things. But you know, it's all about prevention, and I've gotten so many people ask me to give money now to cancer cure. I know I'm We're not doing too well in the war on cancer, by the way. I said, when you start collecting money to tell me how you can prevent that disease, I will give you your right. calls, and they look at you like the Twilight Zone. I enjoy it. But you know, that's really what it's all about. Uh -huh. they don't want, of course, you know they don't want always to prevent it. Because they want you to stay your money. Well, and speaking of prevention, you know, I think a lot of people have a false assumption that their doctor is going to take care of them. Well, my doctor says I'm healthy, so I must be. A it's up to you. It's you who is going to determine ultimately, and it's for you to seek out and find the information you need to determine. So it's you know your doctor. Doctors are humans too. And they don't have all the answers. And well, yeah, yeah, and it, this is a good health food store. They have a little bit of everything. I mean, I was excited to see this Navitas Natural stuff when I walked in today because this is a good company. All their products are raw, organic, vegan, and uh, this is, you know, and they have, they have a bunch of neat little things there, but, okay. Was that enough? <laughs> I mean, I'll stick around up here afterwards if anybody has a question. Just